Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webinar Sexualized Exploitation of Women and Girls Online Harms, Prevention, and Men's Accountability. Uh, it's three hosts today, and it's Men for Gender Equality, Crisis Center for Women in St. Petersburg, and Unison who do this together. And before we go any further, I would like to guide you through some technical issues so that you all can follow easily today. Uh, you attendees are muted, as you might have already noticed, and you will be muted during the entire session. Um, but of course, we would like to hear your thoughts and comments and questions. So please feel free to use the chat for comments. And if you have any specific questions for the panelists, don't hesitate to ask them in the Q&A box down below. Uh, we also have both English and Russian speaking in the panel today, so we have simultaneous interpretation, interpretation, sorry, and if you click on the globe below, you will be able to switch language uh, between English and Russian. Anastasia, would you like to say it in Russian? Да, я бы хотела уточнить, нуждается ли кто-то да, сейчас в переводе на русский из русскоязычных участников. Okay, thank you. Кажется, что нет на данный момент, если что. Окей, uh, okay. uh, so, and the event is being recorded. Uh, so we will share it online on different platforms in the Facebook event and on YouTube. And we will also send it out uh, through to the email links that you uh, registered to. So you will all uh, receive it in one way or another. And of course, we also want to encourage you to not hesitate to contact any of us, uh, the organizers or the panelists afterwards uh, through our email contacts that will be shown later on if you have any further questions or are interested to, to know more about uh, this topic. So, uh, let's see here, okay. So here are our speakers today. Uh, these amazing experts uh, we will have the honor to listen to. Uh, we will begin shortly with the first speaker but before that, I would just like to give you a little bit of a context to why we think it's so important that we talk about these issues and this question about sexualized exploitation. Here are two numbers uh, that probably doesn't say anything to you, but they are very important. Um, these two numbers come from a survey made by two Swedish organizations uh, that was released last week. 1.9 million visits to different sex purchase sites in 30 days. And these uh, 1.9 million are 280,000 unique visitors in 30 days. It feels like I can say that several times and still be quite shocked. Um, and these sex purchase sites that have all these visits are sites where women are, um, <clears throat> they are sold as uh, commodities with a price tag and with user reviews. Um, cases of trafficking has also been uh, connected to these sites according to report. Uh, so it's quite, quite a huge number in the context that Sweden is a relatively small country. Men and boys demand for girls, women and others bodies is not decreasing despite many years of work. The methods and platforms that enable sexualized exploitation online have instead increased. And these so-called dig digital brothels that I just referred to are just one side of it. We also have all the porn distributions, webcamming sites, glamour blogs, Sugar, sugar dating sites and only fans. So as you can hear, it's a huge variety of different forms and they are, are all multiplying. And the expert panel will give you more insight to the different, um, different forums uh, online where women 
girls and others are being sexually exploited later on during the webinar. So, but the sex industry doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in something that we call the porn culture of today. And these images are all examples on um, it's commercial, uh, it's our TV, favorite TV shows, uh, it's the apps in our phones, it's the, and it's the, the way that uh, women's and girls' bodies are being objectified and sexualized and how it's been normalized in our society. So this is basically what we all, and especially young people, meet every day just by turning on their TV or using their phones. And we can also see how this visual language is clearly influenced by the porn and the pornography we see today. And it's made for a male enjoyment, male pleasure. The development to transfer the sex industry to digital forums began long before Corona, but we have seen an, a huge escalation during the last year. Uh, we know that the recruitment uh, is happening, uh, it takes place via TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, basically all the platforms where young people are. And if you would imagine that all the guys and men who buy sex or sexually exploit women and girls online through these digital channels would be standing in a line on the street, the whole society would react. Uh, so it's becoming increasingly important and uh, that we need together make this visible. We, we have to talk about it and we have to make the sexual, sexualized exploitation online more visible uh, as we talk about what's happened both online and in physical rooms every minute of every day. Sexualized exploitation is, in our point of view, men's violence against women, girls and others. And it needs to be addressed and included in all conversation about sexualized violence. And that's how we believe we can make it visible. And to do this, uh, we have come together, a group of organizations, five members of the global network Men Engage, to lift the issues of sexualized violence during a week that we call Week of Visibility of Sexualized Exploitation, STOP SE. And the webinar today is the starting point and it will go on during the entire week until Friday. Uh, and we will have discussions and talks about the causes and consequences of the sex industry. We will discuss men's accountability and the importance of engaging men and boys in this work and in combating sexualized exploitation. We will share our experiences from our own context and the best practices we see uh, to prevent sexualized exploitation and also how we can support serve the women and girls and others in the industry and the ones surviving it. So you will meet experts from the field and survivors, researchers, specialized women's support services and organizations working with men and boys during this week. So with that said, I just want to encourage you all to look closer to the program for, for the entire week and to see if there is anything else that you want to sign up for. Join us to learn more make sexualized exploitation visible and stop men's, men's violence. That's basically the message with this week. And here are some of the topics that will be discussed more in detail. So with that said, I think it's time that I hand over to our first speaker. It's a researcher director at the Swedish organization Talita, and you're warmly welcomed, uh, Megan Donovan. Thank you, Karen. And I want to say thank you so much to Crisis Center for Women in St. Petersburg, Unison, and men for initiating this extremely timely and important event and week of 
events that none of us should miss because they're so, so important, each one of these topics. Um, as Corin mentioned, I'm the research director at Talita. Uh, I'm also an affiliated researcher at Erste um, Hornelbrecke University College. Um, and today I'm going to be talking, the title of this talk is From Instagram Likes to Hardcore Pornography, COVID-19, OnlyFans, and the Evolution of the Online Sexualized Exploitation Industry. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So just a little bit about Talita. Talita is a Swedish organization offering support to women who have been exploited in prostitution, pornography, and human trafficking for sexualized exploitation. Uh, Talita offers both acute emergency assistance and also a long-term exit program. Uh, so we've existed since 2004 and we've met countless women in sexualized exploitation who then have, thanks to our program, been able to fully exit and get back on their feet. Um, and during our many years, we, begin, we began first to focus on prostitution and human trafficking. But over time, we saw the undeniable link between prostitution, human trafficking, and pornography. Uh, some of the women we met had been, for instance, filmed while they were meeting a sex purchaser uh, for the purposes of pornography. Other women were trafficked directly into the pornography industry and then ended up in other forms of sexualized exploitation. Um, and so we kept seeing this kind of this pattern. And so eventually decided that we needed to extend our support services to this target group as well. But we also felt that while we knew that pornography production was going on, you know, in the US, uh, other parts of Europe, we didn't really know what was going on in Sweden. Some people claim that pornography production, you know, it doesn't take place here, it's elsewhere. But we wanted to really see if that was true. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So we decided to do a conduct a study on the pornography industry in Sweden. So we wanted to know where, what are the forums, where is the exploitation taking place, and or if it is even existing, uh, and if so, where is it taking place? What does the recruitment and grooming look like? How are women being kind of groomed into the industry? Um, what are the women's experiences? And then finally, what are their experiences when it came to exiting uh, the industry? So from 2018 to 2019, we conducted this explorative study where we did a mapping of the industry, but also interviewed uh, in-depth interviews with nine women who have been in the pornography industry in Sweden, either they were still there or had exited. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And one thing that we that became very clear during this research was that the background factors that propelled women and girls into the pornography industry were the same factors that propelled women and girls into prostitution and other forms of sexualized exploitation. All the women were young, um, 18, 19, 20, some were even under age, but all of them were young. And of course, being young comes with other vulnerabilities, you know, lack of education, lack of uh, experiences in the labor force, et cetera. Um, all of them talked about having some kind of financial crisis. Uh, the one woman um, had, for instance, been burdened with a huge debt by her ex-boyfriend who also sexually, physically, and verbally abused her. And so in order to escape that crisis, um, a strip club pimp contacted her, offered her an offer she couldn't say no to. And so she took that offer. And of course it then led to further violence and exploitation, sadly. Um, now earlier sexualized violence, that was so clear. And this is something that we at Toledo have seen again and again and again women in prostitution, 
all forms of sexualized exploitation have been abused in some form, as often as children. And this violence, this systematic violence, basically grooms them then into continued violence into the industry. And that has a link then to, of course, poor mental health. These women feel horrible. They haven't received the support, the, um, the help that they deserve and they would need. Um, and so many talked about high anxiety, depression, even suicidal ideation. Um, and this poor mental health then, of course, only exacerbated while they were in the pornography industry. And finally, discrimination. When you look at sexualized exploitation globally, we see that it's always the most discriminated against groups that are overrepresented in commercial sexualized exploitation. So I'm actually originally from Canada. In Canada, we know that women and girls from, um, from our Aboriginal population, they are absolutely overrepresented in prostitution there. Um, and same thing in Europe. It's Oftentimes, for instance, women from poorer countries, um, we often work with women uh, from Nigeria, from Romania, who face discrimination based on their sex, on their race, ethnicity, et cetera. So these, again, they're the, they sound that there was this exact same backgrounds factors that were pushing women and girls into the hands of porn pimps. Now, I should say that por pornography pimps in discussion with these women and girls, we saw that they were extremely active when it came to recruitment. They would actually write to the women and girls directly on their social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, Snapchat. Hey, you're beautiful. Why not come and work for us? And it's easy money. It won't take long, etc. So it's extremely active. And you can go to the next slide. And exactly as we, Jenny, that's not her real name, but this survivor said when I interviewed her, she said that these men, they go after the weakest. They are ugly fish out there who groom young girls and try to get their way. So they're always looking for women and girls who are already vulnerable, who have, for instance, low self-esteem, um, have already been abused previously because they know that with that vulnerability, um, it makes it easier to groom, to control, and ultimately to exploit them. Um, so they're very tactical. They know exactly what kind of woman and girl they're after. And they need to. They need to um, have this strategy because women and girls don't want to be there. So they need to go after the most vulnerable who have very little choice, who already... Um, who are in desperate need of, for instance, money or affirmation, et cetera. And they, they, they need to lie, they need to deceive, they need to manipulate in order to actually end up recruiting these women and girls. I can go to the next slide. And now, I mean, I, we conducted this study before COVID hit, um, but the situation has become so much worse. We know that COVID-19 has exasperated uh, the situation for women and girls, they're extremely vulnerable, many have lost their income, um, and unfortunately, the demand, men's demand for women's um, access to women's bodies has, of course, not decreased, it's increased. And so, uh, um, and so sometimes, actually many times, um, sadly, women and girls, the only thing that they have to sell is their bodies. And then there's the demand. Um, so we see during COVID that the extent to which women and girls are being pushed, propelled into sexualized exploitation is, is, um, is you know, through the roof. Uh, if you go to the next slide. And of course, websites, I'm going to talk more about OnlyFans, but various websites like OnlyFans, it, it's not... Um, it's no coincidence that they've exploded during this past year. I mean, COVID is directly linked to the fact that women and girls are um, vulnerable and pornography pimps know this. And so, for instance, this article that you see here, a pornography website targeted McDonald's workers who were being laid off, who were already extremely vulnerable. 
and offering them, you know, or promising them these huge amounts of money uh, to participate in or be exploited in pornography. And again, the more vulnerable you are, the less bargaining power you have to say no to offers like this. Next slide. And so what we see is that the online sexualized exploitation kind of industry, it's taken a new form. So what we, what we found during our study was that while there are some kind of more traditional pornography producers existing, so producers that would rent, have a studio or rent an apartment, hire the camera team, et cetera, while they exist, we see that there's a new form really, really kind of growing and becoming the most common form. And that is these various platforms where women and girls are expected to upload images and films kind of themselves. And I mean, from a pimping point of view, this is great because they can sit back, they just create this website and, you know, the demand is there. And so ultimately women and girls um, sign up and start, the, you know, um, uploading images, etc. And so they really don't have to do much to earn a heck of a lot of money. We see, for instance, um, not only OnlyFans here, which we will discuss more, but Snapchat Premium, that's also a very, very common way where perpetrators groom and then earn money off of women and girls. Uh, strip Chat, Nordic Finest, this is, it's, it, um, you see here to the left, featuring Scandinavia's most popular models. And so I want you to also take note here of the language that's being used to try and disguise what's actually going on here. So by using the term modeling or many of the websites are using terms like blogging, um, glamor modeling, et cetera, that is an attempt to disguise the actual exploitation that's taking place. We know that women and girls, I mean, young girls are growing up in a, um, in a influencer culture where they're expected to, um, you know, gain as many likes and followers on social media as possible. And their worth is kind of measured in how popular they are on social media. They follow a lot of influencers who have blogs. And so of course, um, when they see that, hey, you can become famous through a blog on say Nordic Finest, OnlyFans, et cetera, it's no surprise that they, they think that that is actually what they're going to be doing. Uh, so from Instagram, um, it's a very, very kind of small step to eventually uploading images where you can get paid. Uh, go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll discuss, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more uh, shortly, but I just want to kind of give you a glimpse of actually how large OnlyFans has become. So this was as of January 1st, 2021. Of course, it's already end of May. So I think the stats have definitely altered since then. But even as of January 1st, 85 million users. So people, so men, primarily men who are subscribing. Um, so paying either for individual content or like paying a monthly subscription to be able to access the women's content. Uh, 1 million so-called content creators. So these are 1 million um, mainly women who are selling sexualized images, um, but they're called content creators. Um, the websites, the platform generated 2 billion uh, over two, 2020. And this is really, really fascinating. And I think really important to, to, to know um, the top 1% of accounts actually make 33% of all revenues. And then the top 10% of accounts make 73% of all revenues. And finally, that most accounts, the absolute majority uh, make almost nothing. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So what we're actually seeing here with some experts have kind of have said that, I mean, OnlyFans is, is in principle like a pyramid scheme. So those um, so-called bloggers who are at the top, they are earning, uh, you know, they, like the top 10 people or whatever are earning, I mean, huge amounts of money, uh, but they are typically already influencers or 
actors and actresses who had a huge, huge kind of platform of followers already. And so for them, it's very easy to earn a lot of money. But as you go down this pyramid, the women, primarily women, are earning less and less and less. And the majority are right at the bottom and earning basically nothing. They also have implemented actually a devious um, commission kind of scheme where um, women are supposed to recruit each other. And so say if I recruit someone else, then during that following year, I would earn 10% of that person's earnings. So it's a huge incentive for girls to recruit each other. And that's why we're seeing, for instance, on TikTok, young girls kind of, you know, uploading these videos saying, I earned so much money on OnlyFans, you should join, et cetera. And it might be the case that they've actually earned nothing, that they're doing horribly, but they have that incentive in order to, you know, put food on the table to make a living. Um, so, I mean, I call it the OnlyFans exploitation model because that's exactly what ha what's happening. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Thanks. And then, as I mentioned before, young girls are growing up in this kind of influencer culture. And what we see happening is that so many influencers, so many stars are creating accounts on OnlyFans. Um, Beyonce sang about OnlyFans in one of her, one of her um, songs, you know, her hits. And that day, the traffic on OnlyFans just skyrocketed. Um, other influencers kind of bragging about how, oh, I finally was able to buy my dream house at 22, says this, um, this woman on the left here. Um, and I, I, I don't know, actually, I think that they must know, these influencers, what kind of effect they're having on young girls today who, and I think they have a huge responsibility. And of course, um, I mean, especially these stars who are already very wealthy, et cetera. It's, it's so sad that they are not kind of taking, account, taking that into account when they are, you know, writing about, bragging about, et cetera, um, how much money they made on OnlyFans. Of course, the young girls are not hearing anything about the, the harms, about the consequences, et cetera. They just see this picture that, wow, this is a person I follow. This is a person I want to be like. And they've also obviously, you know, made their life on, um, on OnlyFans. And maybe this is my chance too. Uh, next slide. And young girls are being bombarded by images, uh, advertisements such as the one you see here. So they're, it's become so, so normalized. Um, I spoke to a girl, a young woman who had been um, exploited on OnlyFans, her ex-boyfriend had uploaded pictures and sold them of her on OnlyFans. And she was describing how among her friends, it's just so normalized. All her friends are talking about it. Most of her created accounts. It's so disturbing and I find so alarming because the sexualized exploitation industry has never been as mainstream, normalized and close to home as it is now through sites like OnlyFans. Uh, next slide. One of the women I interviewed in the study, she said something very, very profound. She said, in today's si society, we're all about selfies and we learn that we should get as many likes as possible. Young people are most affected by this culture. Their boundaries end up being pushed further and further. And the next step, selling images is actually very small. All it takes is for someone to say, you can earn money instead of likes. And that's exactly the message that these recruiters, these pimps are, are, um, are messaging to these women and girls. Hey, you're beautiful. Why not earn money instead of just likes? Um, and so many of these young girls are thinking, yeah, why not? I mean, I need, I need money. I'm in a financially desperate situation. Um, and all I have to do is upload images that I would already anyway upload. But that's actually not the reality. The buyers, the men uh, who are purchasing these images, they, of course, don't want to buy something that they could otherwise get for free. They want to buy 
more and more kind of frequent content. They want to feel like they know this woman, many of them, and they also want to see more extreme content. And so over time, even if the women and girls, which they always do, have strict boundaries, and that's the way to protect their integrity, their dignity, they always have boundaries, but the boundaries end up being pushed further and further because in order to maintain that, that demand for their images, um, that kind of income, they have to produce more frequently and images with more violence um, and more degradation. Um, so that's, and that's, that's the reality. That is, that, that is the kind of essence of this industry that women and girls boundaries are pushed and pushed and pushed. And we as a society have said that that's not okay. That is not consent. That is not, um, that is the opposite of a gender equal society where men push, push and are able to buy access to women's bodies. Uh, next slide. And what we've also seen, um, there was a study done in um, Great Britain where they looked at Twitter accounts that had kind of a tag or hashtag of OnlyFans and selling nudes. And what they found that was that one, at least one third of all of those Twitter accounts were underage girls. And so we're seeing that despite OnlyFans having, you know, an 18 um, um, like age kind of uh, minimum age, uh, it's very, very easy for underage girls to, you know, get access to a fake ID and be able to directly create an account. Um, and of course, these young girls don't understand, um, either don't understand or are in such a desperate situation that um, they have to then try and survive the consequences. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So what we're seeing, what we've seen in our, our study, what we're seeing in other research that's been done in this area um, and what we're seeing you know, among survivors is that these are all different faces of the same system. The women and girls we spoke to during our study, most of them had been involved also in striptease, um, sugar dating, um, other types of prostitution, webcamming, et cetera. So if you go to the next slide, exactly as Melissa, oh, sorry, that's not the right, <laughs> that's okay, I'll come there. Um, can you just hop to the next slide? Yes, this one. So exactly as Melissa Farley, who's a brilliant researcher who's researched prostitution for years and years, exactly as she says, women don't stay in one location, they move from one physical and online location, location to another, wherever the sex buyers are located or where the pimps send them. So we are seeing that women who are in other types of sexualized exploitation, so-called escort prostitution, striptease, et cetera, because of COVID, because no one can, you know, it's harder to, um, to kind of move around with these lockdowns, restrictions, of course, all of the women are being then pushed online. So it's a fallacy to say that this is something else. It's the exact same thing. The sex buyers are the same, the pimps are the same, and they're using the same types of recruitment and exploitation methods as they always have. It's no different. You know, um, compliments, uh, making them feel, you know, seen and like they're beautiful, which then builds trust, and then they can. Um, threaten them and, you know, establish control over them. If you go to the slide, this, like the slide one back, yes, thank you. But what, so what we've seen and what the research is showing us is that all of these different types of sexualized exploitation have similar harms. And we work with these harms uh, at Toledo. Uh, the women have learned how to dissociate. They shut down emotionally. They um, struggle with PTSD and a range of other psychological and physical um, consequences. Um, I can speak more about that. Please feel free to ask me about our work uh, later on. But what we're seeing is that while pornography, um, this online sexual exploitation that we've, you know, we're seeing on OnlyFans, et cetera, 
while it has similar consequences, it actually has also unique and additional consequences. And that is that everything is documented. There's this, there's this, um, you know, kind of eternal um, traumatization because these images are circulating, you know, in all kind of corners of the world. Um, all the women that I spoke to kind of raise this issue that like having that fear that anyone, a boss, a neighbor, even your own child can come across these images and the fear of that sh and that shame, um, it's, it means that many don't even dare to try and exit um, the industry. The damage is already done as one of the survivors um, explained to me. So for us and others who are working and providing support to survivors, we have this kind of additional um, huge challenge. How do we deal with this? How do we, how can we support women who feel that this trauma is something that they can almost never be rid of? Um, and so that additional, that additional harm needs to be accounted for. And I think many, many kind of are tempted to think that, well, at least online, you know, she doesn't have to physically meet a sex purchaser, it must not be as bad. You could think that, but actually this documentation, just like we've learned with, um, with rape victims, we know that rape online has equal, if not more damage than uh, rape offline. So that's super important to keep in mind. Um, you can switch it to the next slide. Oh, sorry, the next one, yeah, yeah. So I just want to kind of summarize and really, really highlight and emphasize that like this, this is it's this is so serious. This is so alarming. And for us who have worked with survivors of sexualized exploitation, who work against violence, who work with survivors of violence, this is so alarming. Uh, and the sex industry has never been so huge, so normalized, widespread as it is today. I realize that all young girls today who have a phone, which is almost all, are right here now at risk of being groomed into this, this industry. Next slide. So I just wanna end by just quickly discussing, okay, what do we see uh, is needed to combat, prevent um, sexual Sexualized exploitation in the form of OnlyFans and other forms of online exploitation. Laws need to be in place. Uh, in Sweden, at least, we have laws, um, very radically kind of gender equal laws regarding prostitution. However, we haven't successfully applied them to online sexualized exploitation. And so that's something we see needs to happen. We need to either be able to use the laws, the tools we have now, or update them because ultimately pimps and traffickers, they seem to always be one step ahead. They know that they need to maximize their profits, minimize their risks, and they do that by repackaging it. So it's the same thing, but they use, use new wordings. Um, they try to camouflage it with kind of you know, blogging, modeling, et cetera, even sugar daddy dating. That's a perfect example of this repackaging of the same exploitation. So our laws need to be able to try and at least stay at the same kind of pace as pimps and traffickers. Um, Toledo, we see that it's so necessary for holistic and long-term support to be offered to women and girls exploited in all forms of sexualized exploitation, we need to see that you know the online, the offline, ultimately it's the same um, or very similar consequences. Um, that needs to be made available immediately to women and girls exploited today. And then finally, prevention. We need prevention through education, schools, parents, young people need to know and understand what this world, what's happening online. And, and I think we adults need to be engaged in these issues and engaged in what our you know kids are doing online um, and I know other uh, participants are going to speak more about the prevention and working with men and young boys and so I really really look forward to that 
But thank you so much for listening. And I really, really am excited to hear from you. Please let me know if you have any questions. And thanks again. Uh, I think my contact details are in the next slide. Perfect. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, I think that we all need to be reminded over and over again of what your research have really put the spotlight on all the factors that make this sex industry striving on behalf of young, especially young women and women and others being abused and the serious consequences that they face of it. So thank you. Okay, so now we will go over to Hanna Korchemna and Anastasia Shuvaye, Shuave, sorry, Shuvayeva from Crisis Center for Women in St. Petersburg. Да, всем добрый день. Мы можем начинать говорить уже по-русски, правильно, я понимаю? Can I speak Russian? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, good afternoon to you, participants. Good afternoon. I'm Anastasia Chuvaeva, and I'm the project manager in the Crisis Center for Women in Russia, in St. Petersburg. And together with my colleague, uh, Hanna Korchemna, we will speak uh, about uh, one of the forms of sexualized exploitation that is webcamming industry. Next slide, please. A couple of words uh, to those who never attended our previous uh, Webinars. Crisis Center for uh, Women in St. Petersburg operates since 1992, and uh, we fight against all forms of violence, exploitation, and discrimination against women. Next slide, please. How we help we offer professional psychological assistance we offer professional legal support to survivors and uh, we organize a lot of awareness campaign training for professionals for practitioners and also for general audiences and we also provide direct assistance uh, uh, such as shelters uh, medical assistance and, and we work with our partners from businesses. Uh, next slide. Today, as I said, we will speak about webcamming. Why? Because uh, uh, as uh, it was mentioned that it is one of the rapidly growing part of the industry of sexualized exploitation. We saw an outburst of webcoming uh, since the start of the uh, COVID pandemic, and it continues. It is not subsiding. And I will speak about a study, a survey that uh, we did of the webcoming industry starting in 2019. Next slide. Uh, about the background of the survey. Over the past few years, we had this idea of uh, it, looking closely at the webcoming industry. Um, uh, we wanted to interview the survivors because we kept getting an increasing number of calls for assistance from women and girls uh, who um, were uh, who had been involved in the webcoming industry in some way. 
and we wanted to examine it more closely to uh, develop ways to deal with this and that gave a, uh, and what gave us an impetus um, to conduct the study it came from the audience when hannah spoke uh, addressed one uh, event where she was one of the speakers uh, uh, and she, uh, she said that she uh, assist, uh, that we assist women in the situation of sex exploitation. A lot of women came up to Hannah asking her questions, and most of the questions were about webcam. Some of them said that they had received a lot of invitations. Some of them were already involved in the webcam industry, and there was uh, a group uh, during that event uh, who were asking how they could help their women friends, their female friends who were uh, involved in the webcaming. We saw how acute and relevant is the issue that it has real urgency. And we immediately launched our first pilot study in 2019. Next slide. So what questions uh, from women did we get? We collected questions and summarized into a few main questions. How to exit webcaming? How to support yourself if you have, or if you are forced to stay in the industry? That's how they worded it. How to deal with your own fear and shame, uh, sh uh, shame of DNN, uh, uh, of having the content uh, collected by the website administrators leaked online. That was one of the most common questions. We spoke about uh, what of what we can offer, and we got questions of where or, uh, women could find help, and many women asked how they could help. Uh, next slide. How they can help a friend who is uh, in this situation. Uh, a couple of words about our pilot study. We had 120 respondents and it lasted between July and October 2019. That was the first pilot uh, stage. Um, we collected stories. Most of the stories were from women, but there were a few from men and one binary persons. The respondents came from more than 30. Uh, cities in Russia and post-Soviet countries, uh, and uh, most uh, of them had been in the webcam industry for about a year or less, but some individual case, we had individual cases of uh, women who had been in the webcam industry uh, for five or even 10 years, and the average age was 20 one years. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, it was interesting for us to look uh, at how women get recruited in the webcam industry. And we saw some interesting figures. 36.6% of our respondents said that they were involved uh, through advice from friends, acquaintances, and even their partner. 44.9% said that they got involved uh, after uh, seeing uh, uh, a job ad and getting a job offer on social media or even on official headhunter websites. Next slide, please. Next. 
We also discussed exit from the webcam industry. Specifically, we asked what difficulties women faced when we were trying to exit the industry. You can see that 50.8% did not see any difficulties. And we tried to look closer at this number, but that we did it at the next stage of our study. But here, we are particularly interested in 19.1% who said that they faced um, real difficulty trying to exit. And uh, the reasons uh, boiled down to the following pressure uh, uh, from the industry, from the site owners, uh, blackmail uh, from uh, those owners who had the content that the women did not want leaked, did not want publicized. And uh, uh, some women uh, uh, did not hear such threats. They were not threatened uh, explicitly, but they knew that this content is in the hands of uh, the website owners. And some women also said that they were not able to find another job, uh, a different job to um, make a living. That brings us back to the question of uh, how free is this choice of being in the webcam industry? Is it really a free choice? And uh, one in four women at the time of the study uh, uh, continued uh, in the industry, although they wanted to exit, but they remained in the webcam industry. Next slide, please. Uh, so very briefly, uh, even a very brief pilot stage of the study showed that the so-called free choice is a myth spread by the webcam industry itself. And uh, the data we collected allowed us to say that it's a huge, well-organized industry with the effective uh, recruitment uh, machinery that it is uh, that they have a, um, a system of involving uh, women through friends and acquaintances uh, and also through headhunters or should we say body hunters uh, it is uh, cost effective uh, and efficient mechanism we so that a number of uh, advertising agencies in Russia who advertise uh, webcam studios, uh, they also um, uh, help assist uh, the webcam uh, platform owners uh, in targeting their audiences and in recruiting their um, uh, next slide, uh, their models. The date here is wrong. It's not uh, the first uh, part, uh, 2019. Instead, it should say 2020. So this refers to 2020, uh, where we um, uh, distributed one, uh, 109 questionnaires, the average age uh, 23, the wide uh, um, uh, geography, um, 22 cities in Russia, but mainly St. Petersburg. 
uh, we looked at the time of recruitment, about half of our respondents uh, had been in webcam business for over a year, and about one third uh, there between two months and a year. And this is a recent sample. This is a recent sample that reflects, next slide please, that reflects the situation in, uh, during the pandemic. Some of our findings, generally our findings are extensive and we will uh, give you a link to our newsletter. We are now um, working on the uh, report from our study. Today, we do not have enough time to cover all of its aspects, so we will focus only on the main myths that are spread by the industry. And to look at the myths and compare them against the reality of upcoming. So I will speak about the myths or groups of myths we and uh, uh, and then I will hand over to Hannah, who will speak about the reality as opposed to the myth. She was also the researcher. The myth number one is money. Why we started with the money? Because it is the easiest aspect to measure and uh, there can't be any different interpretations. So this is an easily measurable parameter that allows us to look at how other myths work. So what are the myths related to money? First, which uh, all of you heard, that the industry allows women to earn big money easily and without any starting investment, without any training or qualification. Also, the re you know, webcam industry recruiters say that it's a good investment potential and that uh, women can um, earn big money fast and then exit. And that the women, they also say that women can stop at any moment, uh, uh, accumulate a base of steady clients and then um, and stay with them. But what uh, we heard from answers from the women. Thank you, Nesta. Next slide, please. Next slide. No. One slide back, please. It's, yeah. So, what is the reality? What are the um, findings of our study concerning money? Uh, the webcam industry is not at all about investing in one's future as opposed to promises. Um, uh, look at how much models give to intermediaries, pay to intermediaries. The owner of the studio withholds his part and then all the other intermediaries uh, withhold their part and the model uh, is left with about 20% of the initially earned sum. But the 20% that she earns, do they ensure her some luxurious life? No, we uh, saw that there is a lot of additional cost that the model needs to cover, which she uh, didn't have to pay for before. This is beauty care, devices, beauty devices, uh, and uh, even if the model provides them, uh, the, uh, the, the studio uh, orders them, the model still pays for them. 
a lot of stress factors which the model has to handle. And uh, most of the money uh, um, model earns, uh, she spends on alcohol, drugs, uh, uh, just uh, to self-medicate to keep her going. Next slide. Another group of myths which partially uh, uh, relates to the first one, the career. What kind of career recruiters um, promise to women? So these are myths. Recruiters say that webcamming is just like any other job, nothing, uh, it is not different from any other job, but it's easier to do. The only thing you need uh, is to gain a pool of regular clients and social capital, and then it will uh, give a good start to your career. Uh, also common are arguments that uh, the studio helps a model create a model account on social media and uh, make her a uh, blogging star mm, uh, when her social capital works for her. And uh, also they say that uh, the um, uh, 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 next slide, please. And this is the reality. What responses we got about the career? Unfortunately, what we can observe are mainly risks. Uh, the, uh, which uh, cannot be even compared to the risks uh, involved in other occupations which people choose, other types of profession. Here we see the um, very adverse conditions, which are very different from what was promised at the start. What we call is anti-social package, we call them. 100% risk of de-anonymization and further blackmail and a lot of judgment from uh, clients, uh, buyers, uh, and uh, from administrators. They all and we, we know cases when the this content was used uh, against the woman who tried to exit there is no training or, or what it means to be a good model there is no clear guidelines what a woman uh, should do uh, it might not sound like a big problem but it's not so simple when uh, there is no agreement, no training, no guidance on what a woman has to do, then the model um, uh, can uh, 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 has no power in this relationship with uh, the owner. She, the, the nothing, uh, nothing is uh, uh, stated in the contract and which actually means that next slide please that the model uh, is forced to do whatever the client wants her to do wonderful uh, in quote quote unquote uh, additions to the career which this is uh, uh, happens uh, um, with over time with, uh, with women involved in uh, the industry, prostitution, pornography, and escort. In um, the offers, the first column is offers uh, when women in webcam industry uh, got uh, offers of. Um, 
being filmed uh, in pornography, uh, etc. Uh, next column is those who were involved in these other types uh, of sex exploitation. And uh, in 2021, we can uh, speak about various factors, uh, uh, but we see that um, women recently in webcam industry, almost 40% of their responses confirm that they uh, were receiving um, offers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, offers uh, uh, to be involved in prostitution and porn. Uh, a few other words about uh, this webcam careers. Uh, we started uh, mentioning the contract that the contract um, can have. Uh, well, a strange things said about the model's future, and we actually got hold of a number of such contracts uh, signed by uh, women, our respondents. What we found, it was uh, not really a contract. It has no legal power. A typical contract signed by a webcam model is uh, a description of rules, uh, fines and penalties, uh, schedule, uh, penalties for being late, etc. Uh, for the uh, but none of these uh, contracts said what exactly the girl was supposed to do, what her responsibilities were. Can you imagine an accountant, uh, a sociologist, any worker who signs an employment contract that does not say what uh, he or she is supposed to do? You can imagine how vulnerable is a worker uh, who um, signs a contract which does not state her responsibilities. Uh, only twice in such contracts we saw the words private shows and uh, clients or members of webcam industry were mentioned, but uh, it is not explained on paper what these clients or members do. Next slide. And here you can see an example uh, in Russian from such uh, a contract. You can see uh, how much um, an employer, how much commission an employer charges. What happens if the model wants uh, um, to rent the studio or to rent the living space. This increases uh, the uh, percentage. It's uh, It actually reminds us of the classical trafficking in human beings when a newcomer is offered um, uh, help uh, with the um, uh, uh, with the living space uh, and with the amenities, uh, but uh, it turns out that it is not for free. And we remember that these women only keep 20%, but uh, when they pay for the rest, uh, they keep even less. So if we look at the real documents and the contract, uh, uh, the, the girls called it a contract, but perhaps uh, the employers uh, either deceived 
them saying that it really had uh, legal value or it was just a term. Next slide, please. Uh, yet another group of myths, uh, conditions. We mentioned it already, what myths are spread about the conditions, um, that webcoming is a good way to raise one's self-esteem and explore your sexuality. There's also um, an, um, um, uh, also, the, uh, the webcam industry says that uh, there is a demand, uh, um, there's always demand irrespective of your age or, or appearance. They um, also say that a studio is like a family with a friendly atmosphere where people come uh, to as a hobby. Some of them bring their boyfriend or girlfriend uh, along. Uh, also, there is a, um, a, a myth that the studio um, uh, helps you can uh, help you find a husband. Uh, this is a, a standard part of a job interview. Uh, Russia is a fairly patriarchal country and the prospect of finding a husband is a big incentive. And also the, the myth is that the studio will give uh, women more independence uh, give them more independence and uh, everything happens online uh, where they can uh, disconnect any time. It's very common. Uh, they also speak about flexible working hours. It's also about career and money. Uh, and they say that the women can combine it with the uh, studies, with having a baby, with other types of work. This argument targets, as we can see, uh, women who already have those other responsibilities, such as parental responsibilities or others. And it shows how well the recruiters know whom and how to target. And uh, then they, um, they target women who have responsibility and need money here and now. And a very common myth is you don't need to do anything special. You only need to talk to clients. You don't have to take off your clothes if you don't want to. Uh, it's like uh, being an... It's a communicator. Next slide, please. What we see here uh, is uh, the, the reality as opposed to myths. A woman can uh, attract a lot of attention from clients uh, uh, during the promo period, the initial period, um, when she does not need to make as much effort to, uh, to arouse um, the interest of clients. Uh, and uh, when recruiters say that uh, uh, any appearance makes you popular, any age. But this is not true. Uh, women who are younger uh, uh, and attractive are more uh, popular. Uh, uh, and uh, especially if she looks very, very young, will be more popular. Uh, there's a lot of stress uh, in this occupation when women uh, inevitably um, uh, 
and get into this trap of uh, uh, continuous stress. Those uh, women who said that before the webcam, they had uh, um, started using alcohol or drugs, all of them saw their um, addiction increase become worse during the web uh, working for the webcam industry the same with eating disorders if they used to have them before they will be much much worse and uh, it uh, there's no way webcaming can help them relax love their body and uh, self-actualize a very high risk of burnout. Next slide, please. Next. No, one before. And we almost exceeded our time, so we'll try to cover the rest um, briefly. Shifts, working shifts. Often women are told that they can uh, spend very little time on webcam and they can manage their own time. But in fact, uh, you do a number of reasons when they get to keep very little, a very small part of their money and uh, they need to make more effort to attract attention and uh, they uh, also need to pay some fixed, uh, make some fixed payment to the studio. They uh, are forced to work more shifts and uh, overwork. And uh, they can not, finally, they cannot refuse to take off their clothes. They are forced to, to model in the nude. Many of them are involved by friends or acquaintances, just like Megan said, uh, the same thing happens with webcaming in Russia. Uh, um, we would uh, like to know who are the friends who recruit into this sphere, but indeed they are get a commission for involving um, a friend, usually the studio administrator or other models uh, uh, can be part of this pyramid scheme and they explain how much they can earn from uh, the um, next slide, please. We have so much to say that uh, we have exceeded our time. Uh, so very briefly and actually very soon we will upload the study report on social media but to sum up recruiters say it's easy it's it's easy to say no to stop to end to leave it is not at all so from our experience and uh, they And uh, the women, uh, once they get in the webcam industry, have to do more and more and agree to uh, harsher practices just to stay in. I will now show our contact information and where you can subscribe to our newsletter letter and contact us. So thank you very much. And we will be glad to take questions. Thank you so much, Hannah and Anastasia, for sharing this important and groundbreaking research with us. I think we are all very excited and looking forward to take part of the report later on. It will come in English as well, right? Mm, great. So we can also send it out to all the attendees to this webinar later on. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And now, with no further ado, I will hand the word over to my colleague, Svante, uh, from Men for Gender Equality, where he's a method developer. 
Thank you, Karin. Uh, I'm uh, very honored to be here today. It's always uh, my uh, uh, role to be one of the few men uh, around uh, in this uh, field. Um, but I'm uh, pretty used to it, but it's uh, always uh, depressing to be so uh, lonely in this position. I wish there were more men uh, here present, of course. Uh, but thank you very much for your uh, excellent work. Um, just to start off, um, my journey uh, in these topics started at uh, this blue house that you see here, the biggest brothel in Europe in uh, Cologne, in Germany. I spent three years there doing a documentary film. It, it was called uh, Like a Pasha, and it's um, uh, available online if you'd like to see it. I, I tried to make a documentary film about the situation at the brothel and why men go there and the situation for the women. And uh, making this documentary film uh, led me uh, into working more with these questions and I ended up at men. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, men or men for gender equality uh, has four main areas that we work with. We're trying to challenge stereotypical masculinity norms. We're working to promote equal parenthood and men's caregiving. We work with violence prevention and uh, preventing sexual harassment. And we also work with uh, offering psychosocial support to boys and men. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we do this and uh, then uh, try to elaborate about why we work with uh, sexual exploitation and why it is so important for us to work with that topic. Uh, next slide. So uh, at MAN, we try to work with a holistic multi-level approach where we address individuals. And we, a, a big part of our work is to engage MAN. Uh, and uh, as you all know, uh, we need to be more visible and take a more clear stand and uh, become uh, a lot more men uh, engaged in this. So we're working a lot on the individual basis. We also work with men's relations and uh, uh, we try to be part of the community around us. And uh, of course, we also work with like legislation and uh, opinion and uh, other parts of uh, society that regards the structures and the systems that uh, make us work. You can go to the next slide. So you can just uh, bring up all the, yeah, thank you. So uh, uh, we are uh, an NGO in Sweden and uh, we're a member-based member organization, uh, but we also work with a lot of different projects and activities. And here are the logos for some of them. Uh, as you can see, uh, we're working with, uh, uh, a lot of our work is aimed at schools. Uh, because we all knew, know that we have to work early with boys to uh, make some change. So a lot of our work is aimed at directly at young men and boys and uh, uh, also towards uh, tutors and uh, all the staff in schools and uh, in uh, different parts of society where professionals are uh, engaging with young boys. Uh, we also work with parenthood and uh, try to empower dads to be more present uh, as uh, parents and, uh, uh, and encourage them to take a more uh, solid responsibility in their relations with women and with their kids. Uh, we also have a program or uh, an activity called the uh, uh, killar.se, boys.se, something like that, which is our psychosocial support 
uh, forum uh, where we offer uh, a chat service five days a week for uh, young men and boys. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, as I said, we're a member-based organization and uh, uh, the last years we've seen a huge increase in members. Uh, this is a slide a uh, few weeks old and uh, now we actually passed 2000 members. And uh, it's, it's been really encouraging to see this inflow of, of men uh, mainly who uh, want to work with these issues and want to take a stand. So right now we're pretty busy just uh, meeting their demand because they want to get engaged. Uh, so that's uh, one of our big topics right now to uh, organize these local chapters and uh, help them to get started with activities. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, we try to approach uh, the, the, the masculinity norms and the consequences of them in a, a life cycle perspective. Like uh, we work with parents, we work with young boys, we work with adults, and we try to uh, approach these problems on like the whole life cycle. And uh, I think it's important for us to see also that this this work takes time. We know that it takes generations, and you can you can see progress too if you look back a few generations back. So we need to have this long, uh, long term uh, goals where we approach uh, all stages of life. We can go to the next slide. So uh, to start off with regarding this, the topic for this uh, um, talk, uh, we have a clear position on porn and prostitution. Sexualized exploitation is men's violence against women, girls, and others and porn is violence, and it's a part of men's violence. Next slide. And uh, our view of masculinity norms, just want to go through them briefly. Uh, we see that gender norms form boys from early age, but it's uh, a, a very clear package of norms that uh, put boys in a, in a situation where they have to adapt to these norms. Violence is a central part of these norms, uh, and uh, it's also a strong part that is based around emotional numbness, numbness and lockdown, and this goes hand in hand. I mean, the violence is a, a consequence of the emotional numbness. Uh, we also see that um, the, the social structures and status systems uh, that uh, are vital for masculinity norms uh, keep feeding men to like to prove themselves uh, in relation to these masculinity norms and of course uh, as we are in a patriarchy being at the winning end makes it harder to get off there's we, we need to 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 show the incentives for for men to to change this uh, the destructive norms and another part of the masculinity norms that is really important to remember when, especially when we're talking about porn, is the isolation part. I mean, there's so much of this destructive masculinity that is going on uh, as a consequence of uh, men and boys not talking to others, isolating themselves and uh, uh, actually like hiding themselves from others. Uh, so this is something that we need to work with. Uh, a lot too. Next slide, please. So, why is sexualized exploitation of women and girls so central for us? Uh, well, listening to you, uh, Anastasia and Hannah and Megan, it's just so obvious that uh, we're at the demand end here. I mean, it's it's totally a man's issue, and uh, we need to be. Uh, really, really clear about that, that we need to uh, put in a lot of work here. And uh, it's a matter of accountability and trust, of course. I mean, how, how can we be trustworthy as an organiza organization uh, that want to ally ourselves with 
women's and feminist organizations if we don't do this work seriously. And of course, uh, as I will talk a little bit about more later, this is uh, part of how we want to change the masculinity norms. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, make it really easy for men to get engaged and uh, take a stand against sexualized exploitation. Okay, next slide. So um, I'm thinking that we need to see that uh, the sex industry and sexualized culture is really part of like the, the destructive masculinity norm cycle here that the, the, the sex industry is, is really feeding on uh, the destructive masculinity norms and exploiting men's uh, destructiveness and the weaknesses. And in, in the same way, uh, really, really reproducing these norms uh, because of what we see in the porn, the porn and, and, the, and the webcamming and, and all of the sex industry and sexualized culture, actually. So we can go to the next slide. So the sex industry is really part of making men this uh, hard group of people to love. Uh, because man gets all these um, ideas and behaviors uh, from being part of and taking part of the sex industry. So um, we see how porn is uh, influencing young boys and men. It, it uh, creates impossible pictures and, of bodies and sex. It makes intimacy a matter of achievement and domination. It creates an image of women as commodities. It really promotes the, uh, the, the lack of consent. And the porn industry especially uh, makes boys lonely, ashamed and confused in front of their com computers and screens. And uh, of course, uh, this is uh, some kind of a drug for our brains. We get uh, addicted to it. So next slide. Um, if we look at prostitution in a Swedish perspective, uh, as you all uh, probably all know, it's uh, illegal in Sweden. Uh, we need to be really clear that this is a man's responsibility and problem. Uh, as you uh, talked so much about Megan, uh, it was really interesting to hear about how the digital world is really taking over this uh, prostitution problem. It's totally, totally depressing. I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking more about what we can do about this. But um, for a start, we can talk about the demand and uh, about men. Um, we can see that porn and the porn industry is uh, uh, really pushing and making men more open for buying sex. This is something that we can see from from all, all, all uh, perspectives. Uh, of course, uh, there is no consent in prostitution. It cannot be. And uh, that is also like how, how we can see that this influence, influences men in how they want to have sex and uh, the problems that comes with that. We can go to the next slide. So, um, we need to talk to young men about porn and why. Well, to start with, uh, porn is real. There's nothing, there's no fantasy in porn. What we see in, in, in uh, porn is uh, real. So the abuse and violence is uh, something that happened uh, for real. And uh, it doesn't matter if it was actors or not, it was real when it happened. And the consequences of porn on men's views on sex, int intimacy and consent uh, is something that a lot of uh, women and girls uh, support organization uh, tell us is uh, a growing problem. And uh, there is uh, a, a, a huge problem that uh, uh, porn is the sexual education for a lot of young men today. And uh, they think that, that that kind of sex is, is normal and, and that's how you're supposed to have sex. And 
of course it, it, it's uh, it's not how it works so we can go to the next slide so uh, um, with all this in mind uh, men started a new project um, a three-year project uh, this spring it's called young men about porn and it's uh, all about getting uh, young men and boys to open up and talk about porn and uh, seeing porn for what it is. You can go to the next slide. Uh, as I told you in the beginning, we have this psychosocial uh, support chat open five days a week. And a lot of the, the, the talks that we have there with young men and, and boys is about sex, intimacy, penis sizes and uh, relations and uh, a lot about porn too. And here's some of the, the questions that we often encounter. Is it normal to watch porn? Is it dangerous, dangerous to watch too much porn? I'm a porn addict and it ruins my relation. Is there any porn that isn't fucked up? Should it hurt for girls when they have sex? So, uh, boys and young men have a lot of questions about porn, of course. And uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being curious on sex. It's totally normal and natural and uh, whatever, you know. But, uh, and it's kind of clear too that a lot of young men and boys understand that there's something wrong about porn. And you can see it in a lot of the chats that we have in this uh, in our support uh, chat that uh, they wonder about sex and porn like uh, should it really be like this and uh, is this uh, how it's supposed to to look really and uh, a lot of problems of course with uh, addiction and how to stop uh, watching porn you can go to the next slide so what we're seeing is that porn is, is an excellent eye opener for boys and men. And uh, we can actually use this totally depressing situation because porn is really a good starting point for uh, talking about inequality and feminism with uh, young boys and men. Uh, there's, it's a, I think it's a, you know, it's an easy way to uh, convince men about what's wrong with uh, sexism and uh, oppression and uh, I think that this this will be a, an interesting project and see how far we can can reach uh, trying to um, develop methods for like accelerating this these discuss this discussions okay maybe I, I need to uh, hurry up here thank you Karin for bringing up the next slide. Uh, so here's uh, some findings from uh, a survey that uh, Unison in Sweden did uh, last September. Uh, they could see that the support for um, limiting distribution of porn pornography is high in Sweden. 71% would like to have le legislation that limits online distribution of porn pornography. Women are more positive, no surprise. And 91% of women in the age of 18 to 79 wish to limit online distribution of pornography. But also that boys in the age of 13 to 15 are more positive, 72% towards limitation of online distribution of pornography than men in other age groups. And this is uh, encouraging statistics, I would say. Can go to the next slide. So, how uh, do we address these problems? Uh, we are working hard to get more men engaged, and we, of course, address this as a problem of male entitlement. It's part of, of the masculinity norms, and we need to be clear about that uh, men don't have the right to other people's bodies. Where the problem and solution, uh, we need to be clear about uh, men's responsibility. Uh, we're working also with the bystander approach that you need to talk to others about this. 
and you need to be more uh, brave in approaching others, other men around you. But also we need to uh, really try to see that men need to understand that there are real victims in the sex industry. These are not robots or uh, online characters. Uh, they are real people and uh, they have been victims of sexual abuse and violence. And uh, we need to try to reach for men's empathy in uh, understanding this. Next slide, please. So uh, we do this work uh, in our local chapters and uh, we have activist-run conversation groups uh, where um, they talk about porn and sex. Uh, these perspectives are, are part of uh, some of our methods that we work with in schools, like uh, Mentors in Violence Protection and uh, Macho Fabrican. Uh, as I said, we have the support chat that, where we meet boys and young men, and we uh, try to, to make boys and young men see and understand sexualized ex exploitation and uh, be part of stopping it. And in this new project, we will uh, really narrow down on porn, but uh, prostitution is part of the sex industry too. So we will try to to uh, work with finding new methods for this and also being part of an international discussion and a systematic approach to limiting distribution of porn for especially young people. Um, next slide, please. And uh, it's important to see that there's no magic in this. We just need to be more uh, vigilant, we need to be more men who do this work, and uh, uh, we need to work with all uh, groups of men in society and find methods to reach them and get them engaged. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Svante, <clears throat> and thank you for making making it uh, really uh, um, clear why it's so important to get men and boys involved and engaged in this and sharing how, how we do it. Um, and sorry for pushing you. I, it was a mistake to flip the, <laughs> the slide. Um, so we are now going to stop sharing this so we can all see each other. Um, okay and have a little panel talk for the last 15 minutes. Um, there have been uh, a quite active uh, chat and Q&As. Uh, so we will start with some questions from the participants. Um, so the first question to all of you, I would say but we could start with maybe you, Megan, uh, is you have talked about how women are oppressed in the porn industry. Is there the same pressure on men in porn, for example, male porn actors or gay webcamers, or is there not? Yeah, thanks for that question. I just typed a little bit as well, but I'll, I'll respond also here. Um, we have actually an ambassador, his name's Don Israeli, and he grew up in the pornography industry because his father was a porn producer. And so he saw kind of the industry from the inside out. Um, and he recalls um, speaking to one, one man who was being filmed in so-called gay pornography. Um, and so Daniel asked him, are you gay? And this guy kind of puts a chokehold on Daniel and says, I'm not gay, I'm hungry. And I think that is really, really telling about the, the fact that men in pornography are also absolutely oppressed. Um, at the same time, I think it's one, we need more research on it. Um, there's not enough research in general on women in, pro in pornography. And so much more research has to be done on different groups as well. But I also think it's important to keep in mind that we know from research that basically all violence is being committed by men against women in pornography. So then of course the harms are unique when comparing women versus men. 
but still super important to bring up. And I really, really look forward to seeing more research um, investigating a men's situation. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Hannah or Anastasia, do you want to comment on the question as well? Давайте, может быть, я начну, коллеги. Perhaps uh, I will start. In our study, as Anastasia said, uh, in both parts of our study, we had very few uh, respondents who identified as men or non-binary persons, maybe three to five persons in each round. It's very small numbers for any generalizations. So unfortunately, we, we cannot say that we have enough data to make uh, an assessment. But in one interview, at stage two of our study, when we uh, asked, uh, interviewed women in webcam industry, they spoke about relationships with their studio colleagues, both men and women. They, they spoke about uh, what they heard from male webcam models. Uh, and from what we heard from our respondents, the demand for men is mainly from other men and those male uh, webcam models uh, spoke that they um, posed as gay although they were not gay and uh, the women as well some of them are bisexual some lesbian but the demand is from men and uh, although the uh, owners, studio owners said that you can choose, you can choose your clients, but you cannot, you cannot choose uh, according to your sexual orientation. And we were asking, do you, are you aroused? Uh, were there any clients who made you aroused whom you would perhaps agree to date <coughs> offline? And in principle, were there any cases? You, we had a universal no, no arousal. It is not about being sexually aroused. It's about faking sexual arousal to someone who perhaps, um, whom you perhaps don't like and you're not attracted at all because you're not attracted to men. Uh, I think you gave an exhaustive answer about this situation and perhaps the main thing is to look at the demand side and uh, and it can uh, it is uh, it can be seen from any studies our and other studies and other interviews we saw and this is the main focus on the demand side <clears throat> thank you Okay, so uh, Svante, do you have anything to add? Have you come across anything that could be an answer to this question? No, not really. I mean, I, I, uh, I, um, I remember at the brothel where I was uh, uh, for a long time, there were also male prostitutes and uh, they shared the same uh, experiences that uh, Hannah was talking about, so. Mm. Okay, thank you. And uh, the last question from the panelist, or sorry, from the participant is one about um, porn making studios that do porn for women or claim they do porn for women, uh, where they depict women as truly as, as we truly are, a subject of pleasure, not objects of conquest. And this specific um, producer is called Be Be Belisa House. Belisa House. Can I, can I, uh, I, I'd like to say that, I mean, there is of course a problem with porn, but I mean, we need to see porn uh, no matter how it 
it is done and by uh, whom as the problem uh, in the in the patriarchy the, the 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 problem is how it ties to masculinity norms and the destructive masculinity and uh, as, as long as we have these power problems and uh, problems with violence and sexualized exploitation it doesn't really matter how the porn looks uh, because it will tie into these narratives and pictures uh, so it, it's a tricky one but I, I, I think we need to to be kind of clear about that mm. thank you Sante yeah that's a very important point um, so but the, uh, the participant is asking us if we know um, if we have heard about Belisa house Megan, no, have you heard about them? I haven't, but I mean, there are a lot of different so-called producers that are, you know, going out saying they have, they're producing feminist porn. What is feminist porn? That's to us and to many others, kind of an oxymoron. Pornography is about the sexual exploitation of women's bodies, so there's nothing <clears throat> feminist about it, especially if there is an exchange of money. I mean, as soon as a woman's, like, access is bought to a woman's body, that removes a consent. You can never guarantee consent um, and you can't guarantee consent the rest of her life. And that's ultimately what she's, she's having to kind of sign up for because these images are gonna be online forever, potentially. Um, and it's a classic kind of trick used by many different producers. Um, there's been research comparing female and male producers. And the only difference is that it's women on women, but the violence, the amount of violence is typically the same. And so ultimately, I mean, feminist pornography, until we have research showing that it actually exists, I mean, it's, it's kind of silly to even talk about because ultimately the 99.99% is nothing, has nothing to do with feminism and it's not what men and boys are consuming. Thank you, Megan. taking um, part in films uh, are the same. It's and uh, uh, usually these same women uh, end up uh, in porn. The same vulnerable women, which actually supports our early argument. Mm. Thank you. And Savante, do you want to? Add anything you started out there. Svante, do you have something? Okay. Then I'm thinking that for the last five Потому minutes that we have. Думаю, последние пять минут, которые у нас есть. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Irina. Um, uh, I have a question for all of you, so I would like to get, get a, a short answer from all of you on the question, from your perspective, what do you see needs to be done in order to limit, regulate access and end sexualized exploitation online? It's a big question, but if you have to try to give a couple of pointers on what you see is most necessary, uh, we would love to hear it. Uh, maybe Hannah and Anastasia, you can start. Настя, может быть, ты начни, я дополню. Так, слушай, организация, да, в первую очередь. We are um, a helping organization, a service organization. Uh, the main question for us is how to help people better. What's a better way to help? 
and I cannot even compare the resources available to the industry and our resources. So we understand that their resources are enormous and uh, we need to act at different levels, at the legislative level, which, which is uh, very much beyond our control, but we can work with mass media, with the, we can run awareness campaign to make the problem visible. This is something we can do, and which we've been trying to do, which it's also important to use the same platforms for educating people, the same platforms that the industry uses for recruitment. We need to focus on them. We often uh, see that helping organizations exist in their own silo. They are isolated. And, uh, the, and here, events such as the Visibility Week uh, should be advertised on various platforms. And, uh, social media and the facts should be made visible and uh, we need to involve as many people <coughs> as possible education and awareness raising is an important focus for us i will add uh, in in terms of counteracting sexualized exploitation online it's very important uh, for women's and men's organizations to work together or organizations helping survivors and victims and organizations uh, working on changing values on changing uh, uh, toxic masculinities why i believe we need to work together unfortunately when uh, a woman speaks about that the to uh, the main uh, target audience, and the main target audience is men. The demand side uh, are men, and uh, women are not listened to, no matter whether we have uh, academic degrees and how many academic publications we have. Uh, we do not have sufficient social capital for the um, for their clients because most of them are patriarchal men so we need male ambassadors male ambassadors to um, to manifest accountability telling other men why they believe it is important why they believe purchasing another human, uh, another person's body is an awful thing to do. Why um, uh, in St. Petersburg, for example, we can see ads with uh, <coughs> women's names and phone numbers and everyone knows that it's about prostitution. Only women's names, no male names. So, uh, which uh, illustrates the uh, demand and supply sides. We need to talk to those people who, um, who are targeted by those female names and phone numbers, and who are the reference group for these men. And Svante and his colleagues work on the work of our male colleagues in Russia who raise awareness, who do prevention work with men. I believe it, it is the most important thing because we are often not listened to. Thank you, Hannah. So super, super, super short because the time has run out, unfortunately. But Meg and Svante, do you have anything you want to add? Meg, you can start. Yeah, uh, what's already been said is spot on. Uh, thank you so much. And I just want to add that 
I mean, I think we were in the same position before we, for instance, implemented our prostitution laws. We said, I don't, this, you know, we felt uh, disenchanted. This is never going to work. And obviously it has. It's had a huge impact. And I want to emphasize that it's not just a law, but it's the three pillar model. So law, support, and prevention, as I kind of presented in my presentation. Um, an example as well, like by supporting survivors as well, that is ultimately going to help then hold these perpetrators accountable. In the US, we <clears> see <throat> so survivors coming together and suing these pimp operations. And so I wanna see more of that. And I think that is one way that we can end sexualized exploitation by um, the onus being placed on the, the perpetrators and away from the victims. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Svante, last words? Yes, I'm thinking that uh, for me as a man and uh, representing a, a man, uh, we need to stay accountable, uh, keep listening and understanding the impact of uh, the sexual exploitation. And uh, <laughs> our work is to engage men, get more men out there and do the work that uh, Hannah described. Uh, so thank you for, for that. Thank you. And thank you so much to the entire panel. Uh, you've done a great job getting us into these questions on the depth. So I just want to say, uh, join us during this week on hashtag stop SE. Uh, we will link to the program and send out all the information you need to everyone who was uh, re uh, registered to this event today. So thank you. And I hope to see you more this week. Bye.